Are they marked? So good morning. Lieutenant Governor Polito and I are pleased to be here today at Fenway Park, and we want to thank Sam Kennedy and the, and the Red Sox for hosting us here. Um, I also want to thank everyone with the Red Sox organization and with CIC Health for their tremendous work in setting up this mass vaccination site. Before getting into more details on the vaccination efforts here, I want to give some quick updates on the Commonwealth's COVID-19 data and vaccine effort. Yesterday, the Department of Public Health reported 1,963 new cases out of 61,265 new tests. At this point, over 13.7 million total tests have been conducted here in the Commonwealth, which is a massive number, which is why Massachusetts is a national leader in testing. 1,631 individuals are in the hospital, 353 are in the ICU. This represents very significant progress since the start of the new year. Hospitalizations are down 31% since they peaked on January 4th, and the number of patients in the ICU has decreased by 20% since the number peaked on January 12th. On vaccines, as of Monday night, 654,104 doses have been administered to residents, and over 1 million doses have been shipped to providers across the Commonwealth. Despite some snow, the vaccine effort carried on as planned, and for the most part, the sites worked well throughout the day. With respect to Fenway, the mass vaccination site here launched last week and officially op opened to the public on Monday for all eligible groups. So far, 1,200 doses have been administered, and we expect about 500 doses to be administered per day this week, and we expect Fenway will ramp up to over 1,000 doses a day next week, and for the week after that, 1,250 doses a day. Sam was making noise about even more than that at some point down the road. Um, but we expect that this site certainly should be able to ramp up to doing about 8,000 doses a week uh, in the not too distant future. This week, the crews running the site did a terrific job of working throughout the winter storm on Monday, encouraging people to visit Fenway earlier if they could, and in the late, if they had late afternoon appointments. And anyone who needed to reschedule their appointment was able to be rescheduled for later this week. Fenway is the second mass vaccination site launched here in the Commonwealth and we expect to have at least seven mass vaccination sites across Massachusetts in the not too distant future. At Gillette, 23,000 doses have been administered, and in Springfield, which opened last Friday, 2,741 doses have been administered, and the mass vaccination site that opens today in Danvers, we expect will do 500 doses uh, today. In collaboration with the city of Boston, the mass vaccination site at the Reggie Lewis Center opened earlier this week, and that site's currently serving residents of Boston, but will transition at some point to a mass vaccination site by the end of the month. We'll have more details to share on other mass vaccination sites soon as we continue the rollout. For people seeking appointments, we encourage you to first check out the mass vaccination sites if you're able to get to one. The sites are highly efficient, and they have the capacity to do hundreds and, in some cases, thousands of shots a day. Each Thursday, new appointments will be available for the mass vaccination sites, and this week, over 55,000 new appointments will go live for the following week at the mass vaccination sites. And we expect this number to continue to grow each week as the sites ramp up capacity and as more mass vaccination sites become available, and hopefully as we receive more vaccine from the federal government. There are also appointments available more regularly at smaller site sites across the state. For import appointments at other sites, pharmacies including Walgreens and CVS Health post appointments daily. That totals up to about 15,500 slots per week. Retail business pharmacy sites at Stop and Shop in Hannaford and top coast sites, including Wegmans, Big Y, and Price Chopper, post about 4,000 appointments every week. And other appointment sites, including uh, healthcare locations, local vaccination sites done with the Board of Health, will also post 
uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 55 to 60,000 appointments over the course of this week. Overall, that's about 120,000 uh, new appointments that are being made available over the course of this week. And we'll continue to add to that capacity as we go forward. For people seeking appointments, everybody should understand that it may take several weeks in some cases to schedule an appointment. Please be patient and recognize and understand that everybody who's eligible during each particular phase of this will get an appointment and an opportunity to get vaccinated. It's going to take some time to get through our priority groups due to the limited supply of vaccines that we receive each week from the federal government. And while that supply is limited, we're working to rapidly increase our infrastructure to be able to vaccinate people so that we'll be ready when more vaccine becomes available. There are currently about 125 operating vaccination sites in the Commonwealth, and we expect to have 165 sites available by the middle of the month. This is obviously an ongoing process, and we're also working to add more sites in some communities that have been particularly hard hit by COVID. At this point in time, there are about 50 community health centers that have sites that are up and operating and vaccinating their patients. We're also opening up two new sites in uh, Walgreens is opening up two new sites in Mattapan, two sites in Roxbury, site in Dorchester, Chelsea, Revere, and Everett, and a community vaccination site also opened in Brockton, which is being run by the local Board of Health. Next week, we expect an additional 30 pharmacy sites. We'll add around 21,000 appointments, primarily for communities that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID. In addition to the big sites like the one here at Fenway, we're partnering with local boards of health, community, community health centers, and pharmacies um, on a variety of strategies to make sure that we cover more ground here in Massachusetts. The strategy here, obviously, is to try to make sure that in many communities that have been hard hit by COVID, we have familiar and trusted providers available uh, to them to provide them with the opportunity to get vaccinated. The vaccine's safe. It's been through the same trials that all vaccines go through, and it doesn't contain the actual virus. Millions of doctors, nurses, and medical professionals across the country have already received both doses, and we hope that by partnering with all these different sites, people can get the, the safety message that's associated with this and hopefully have an opportunity to discuss it and receive that message from a trusted medical profession and in turn make the decision to get vaccinated themselves. We know the sign up process for vaccinations has been frustrating. Uh, and we're working to make improvements with respect to that. We updated the website this week to add eligibility checkers and the ability to search by zip code to find a site that's open and available to you. And we're working to stand up a call center which we'll have more to say about later this week. More sites and new appointments are being added regularly to the map at mass.gov slash COVID vaccine. So people should feel free to check that uh, as we go forward. We all know that vaccines are a big part of the way out of this pandemic. And it's good to see that so many people want to get a vaccine. But since there's currently a limited supply, it's important that we manage our process and try to see if we can't serve the people who are most at risk first. And it may take somebody a few weeks to get an appointment, but the vaccines aren't going anywhere and they will continue to come to the Commonwealth and we believe in greater numbers over the course of the next several months. I think many of us are waiting to see what happens with uh, the EUA application, the emergency authorization application for J&J, &J, which would obviously put another vaccine into the mix from a manufacturing and distribution point of view, which would then add additional capacity to the national distribution system. We'll keep working on expanding sites like this and working with our colleagues in local communities and with local provider organizations to continue to expand their capacity. And we will continue our program to roll out vaccines in congregate care settings, assisted living facilities, senior housing, and other sites where in many cases some of our most vulnerable residents reside. And with that, I will turn it over to Sam Kennedy.
Thank you very much, uh, Governor Baker. Appreciate that. Thanks for being here today. Um, if we've uh, learned anything this past year, uh, I think it is that leadership matters. Um, it uh, has been a painful year for uh, everyone, and, and we're just really grateful as um, business operators here in Massachusetts uh, that we've had the steadfast, steady leadership of Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito, Secretary Sutters. Um, boy, to be leading the Commonwealth through a global pandemic um, is not a task that uh, I think many people would want to sign up for. So thank you for all you've done. Uh, on behalf of John Henry, Tom Werner, Larry Lucchino, our whole Fenway Sports Group partnership, um, we are very, very proud to play a small part in the healing. Fenway Park has uh, been a, a place for great moments uh, over a century plus in Red Sox history, but it's also been a place uh, for healing in the wake of 9-11, in the wake of the bombing in 2013, and now as we all combat uh, this virus, we're glad to play a small part. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone for allowing Fenway Park and the Red Sox to be a part of the healing. Um, I want to uh, throw a few thank yous to the people uh, that have come today, uh, come together to make it happen. Uh, Representative John Santiago is here. I call him Superman. Uh, he's on the front lines dealing with the crisis at Boston Medical. He's serving his country overseas, uh, helping us um, protect our uh, troops. Uh, he's a great leader in our city and very thankful for him being here today, making the time out of his schedule. I want to thank uh, Marty Walsh and Catherine Burton at the city uh, for all they do uh, for the Red Sox and for Fenway and the neighborhood. Uh, my colleagues, Jonathan Galula, Sarah McKenna, Dave Friedman, Peter Nesbitt, you guys are tireless and have made this work, and I'm very, very grateful. To Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, Kevin Tab, Pete Healy, thank you uh, for our longstanding partnership. Dennis Cataldo from Cataldo's here today, thank you for uh, all of your employees and, and making this possible. Uh, and our next speaker, uh, Tim Rowe, founder of CIC Health, uh, you are a rock star. Thank you for um, making this all work so smoothly. Um, when you're done with this mission, maybe you can come in and help us uh, construct another World Series championship team. Uh, and we're really looking forward to the 2021 campaign. Uh, so thank you very, very much for being here today. And uh, Tim, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, on behalf of myself and our co-founder, Dr. Atul Gawande, I wanted to thank Governor Baker uh, Lieutenant Governor Polito and uh, Secretary uh, Mary Lou Sutters of the Department of Public Health. Um, this has been an amazing uh, opportunity for us uh, that you've given us to, to help. Um, and um, I hope all of you who are experiencing this process for yourselves and for elders in your lives uh, that you are made a little bit safer for that. Um, I want to call out uh, specifically Dr. Ullman at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, who is, I think, downstairs overseeing the operation right now, uh, making sure that this is done right and according to medical guidance. Um, uh, Sam kindly thanked a number of the others. I do want to call out Dennis Cataldo and his team at Cataldo Ambulance, who have been terrific. Um, also, Dave McGillivray uh, from DMSE Sports. Those of you who don't know him, he's the race director for the Boston Marathon. And if you think these things run smoothly, a lot of that is thanks to his team, the Boston Marathon team, which are incredible logisticians um, who are making everything work. Uh, we also have a team of doctors at PWN Health. It's a national organization. Um, after you've gotten your vaccine, if you have a question, if you're feeling funny, if there's anything that you need, you can get on the phone right away with a doctor, and they will talk you through what you're dealing with. Um, they, uh, they field hundreds of calls uh, every day uh, for the folks that are coming through these vaccine sites. And that, that is all part of this process. Um, first and foremost, or last and foremost, I want to thank uh, our team at CSE Health. Uh, Rachel Wilson over here in the back, if you want to raise your hand. Rachel actually runs everything to do with this here and at Gillette and our other sites day to day. Um, if you were uh, kind of behind the scenes, you would see uh, emails go out at midnight, 12.30, 1 a.m., as we're dealing with the, the, the things coming in the next day, how we're going to handle it, how we're going to handle a snowstorm, how do we make the, the, best, the next one better than the last one. So all of this has just been um, phenomenal and, and gratifying for me to watch. Um, 
Uh, Dr. Chris Kaufman in the back, if you want to raise your hand, is our, our lead vaccine coordinator across all of the sites. If you have any technical questions about vaccines, how they work, how to store them, how to make them safe, Dr. Kaufman can answer those questions. Um, so I don't want to drag this out, but just to say uh, thank you all for being collectively part of a collaborative process where we have taken an unusual situation that none of us have seen before, and we're making it work. And under Governor Baker's leadership and the leadership in Washington, uh, we, are, we are addressing this problem, maybe not as fast as everyone would like us to do it, um, but we're making it work, and we're going to continue every day to try to do an even better job with that. Thank you very much. Questions? So um, the, I mentioned in my remarks that there were 30 pharmacies that would be opening next week. Um, that is driven in part by the Biden administration's decision to move um, more vaccine directly uh, to pharmacies as part of their distribution plan. And we are still working on what I would describe as sort of the one week uh, window into visibility. Um, and we certainly don't expect, um, I mean, the commitment's basically been you're not going to get less. Um, but at this point in time, they're still working out what they think a ramp would look like going forward. And, uh, and we're basically planning for an assumption that, you know, what we've got in the last few weeks will probably be pretty consistent with what we get over the next few. Yeah. Yeah. New doses, yeah. You can either call them or you can go to their websites or you can go through the MassVac site. Um, to those pharmacy locations and book an appointment. And they all in represent roughly 15,000, what we think of as 15,000 incremental new appointments that will be available starting next week. And how many people involved in this current case can do that right now? Yeah. Governor, we're hearing from a lot of senior citizens who cannot make it to appointments because they can't make it to the library, they can't make it to the case. Any plans or, I know you said two more mass sites are coming. So, first of all, there's a lot of conversation going on between our administration, um, healthcare providers down on the Cape, and and others to expand access to um, to vaccine sites on the Cape. Same things going on in other parts of Massachusetts as well. Um, but I'm not going to. I mean, I can't speak to. Uh, who the players might be and how this is going to work until some of these discussions have been finalized. But um, but there are conversations going on with the with the most important players in those areas to figure out how to continue to expand capacity. Are you waiting for more doses so that you can stand them up? Because you had mentioned you don't want to open up all these places and then have no vaccine. Well, that would be a big concern, yeah. And and as I said, we're still the administration knows um, the Biden administration has heard from I think every governor in the country that we would really like to see two or three weeks worth of visibility into the supply chain. Um, and they have said to us that that is something they are going to seek to do. Um, but at this point in time, we're still playing the, the one week game. Well, I think I said as of what I say in my remarks as of as of yesterday. Um, I do it from memory, but I get it wrong. Um, as of yesterday, <laughs> drum roll. No. Um, can be on the last page I look at. As of Monday, Monday night, okay, 654,000, 104,000 doses, 104 doses out of uh, just over a million that have been shipped to providers in Massachusetts. So that's about 60% plus, a little bit more. Is, is 
Does that change that uh, you guys talked about the last week with the 10 day deadline to redistribute if people aren't using them? Does that help you at all? Well, you do, have, you do have provider organizations that had um, originally received doses to vaccinate employees who are now taking those doses and calling um, patients in their panels who, are, who qualify and having those folks uh, come in to get vaccinated. That started this week. Um, in addition to that, some of the growth in the pharmacy volume will be coming out of an oversupply on the long-term care and the SNF program. One of our big issues here in Massachusetts was they gave us, they, they sent way more vaccine book to Massachusetts to the long-term care piece than were actually arms available to vaccinate. And so part of the reason why we're going to see a significant increase in the number of pharmacies that are doing retail next week is because some of what was originally supposed to be part of the pharmacy program for long-term care is now going into the community. Both of those things should make a difference with respect to um, the relationship between shipped and administered. When did cities and towns uh, expect getting direct shipments to you know, councils that are aging, fire departments, whatever, right? The fire chief can buy it down. Has a list of people who's going to get it, but he doesn't have a vaccine. So um, it depends a little bit on the nature of the community. You, you got to do a certain, at this point in time, you have to be willing and able to do a certain number of vaccinations. You have to have a universe of potential um, uh, people to be vaccinated that reaches a certain threshold and you have to have the ability to store and manage two very complex um, vaccines currently. One of the nice things about the J&J &J vaccine, if it gets approved, um, is it doesn't have some of the issues with respect to storage that we have with both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine. Um, and I also believe that as we get into what I would describe as the general public, you'll, we will be a lot more interested in distributing this far more broadly um, because at that point in time, we won't have some of the rules associated. If the J&J &J thing gets approved, we have a much easier vaccine to administer and manage and support in settings that don't have access to deep freeze. The second is we'll then have a much bigger universe uh, of people that will be looking to vaccinate, which will make it easier for us to think about how to incorporate additional support at the local level into this. But we already have, in many parts of Massachusetts, um, local boards of health and local communities that have banded together to create uh, the vaccine infrastructure that's necessary to participate at this point in time. Governor, there have been some concerning statistics coming out of the CDC that only 5% of the people who receive vaccine are black and that 60% are white. The Reggie Lewis Center, we're seeing a long line of white people waiting to get vaccine at the Reggie Lewis Center. I know you said you were going to hold some doses back for people of color. Are those doses at the Reggie Lewis Center supposed to be going to people of color? And what can we do to increase uh, people accepting it? So one of the big things I think everybody's learned from the conversations about um, who wants a vaccine uh, and who's waiting um, is for many people of color, it's important that the provider be somebody they consider to be a trusted part of their community. And that's one of the reasons why there are 50 CHCs, community health centers, which are in many cases trusted parts of their community, who've been a big part of how we thought about this rollout uh, from the beginning. In addition to that, um, the city of Boston, which is currently sort of co-running the Reggie Lewis Center with us at some point, they're going um, to sort of have us uh, do it fully, is setting up specific days for people from the neighborhood. And, um, and they and some of the folks from CIC Health, which is going to be administering that, have been talking to many of the trusted players in those communities about what they and we can do together to try to encourage people to take advantage of those um, of those days that will be specifically designated uh, for people in those communities. And if you look at where most of the CVS expansion and the, uh, and the Walgreens expansion is going to happen, um, again, an entity that a lot of people go to for, you know, pick up their prescriptions and that type of thing, especially when you're talking about older people, um, those folks are also um, going to be operating, coming out of the gate for the most part in communities that have been disproportionately affected by COVID. And we've also made pretty clear to a lot of the folks on the provider community, 
who when they got done vaccinating their employees, we said to them, we'd like you to start vaccinating your patient panels, but we would like you to do that in places where you and we all agree we've had significant issues um, with, um, with communities that have been disproportionately affected in the per first place. And that's where most of them are focusing their efforts. Um, and I think that trend will build over time. And hopefully we'll be able to use those trusted community partners to get folks in uh, and to enhance and improve our vaccination numbers there. So the doses that are being held back, how does that work? What do you mean? A certain number of doses, I think, Mary Lou Sutter has said, are being reserved for people of color. How does that I think of it I think of it as more as a designation than a holdback. I mean, there are, I think there are 37,000 doses with community health centers right now. Is that about right? Basically, it's, it's more an issue about placing them in places with providers that you believe um, can, in fact, um, bring folks into their organizations and get them vaccinated. 37,000, okay. Governor, when you, when you ran twice, you ran as uh, a manager of state government. That's what you So um, I guess the first thing I would say is that uh, I get how unhappy many people are with the rollout, okay? I hear it, the Lieutenant Governor hears it, Secretary Sutters hears it. Um, there are some reasons for that unhappiness that have to do with the decisions we made out of the gate, which I do not apologize for. The decision we made to vaccinate straight out of the gate, hospital workers and other healthcare workers, especially those who are frontline to COVID, the decision we made to organize and structure a very significant and complicated outreach program to congregate care providers who serve people with mental health issues and developmental disability issues and other special needs, and the decision we made um, to choose to be focused early on on some of the populations that would not necessarily homeless people who would not necessarily be part of the rollout in many other places um, i think we did the right thing there um, but i get the fact that that meant other people needed to wait and um, and i'm not satisfied with where we are i know the lieutenant governor and secretary sutters aren't either but one of the things we tried to do as an administration, and I think have done well, um, is to be open to criticism and to take criticism and to make adjustments and to get better. I mean, I remember everybody in March all over us about the quality and the capacity we had to test. And most people, including people in this room, didn't believe we would ever get to the numbers that we talked about as we went through that process of expanding and rolling out our testing program. It's now the second biggest per capita testing program in the country. And it's turned out to be a tremendous asset in terms of our ability to identify cases, to trace cases, and to help people stay healthy and not to pass the vaccine on to others. So, look, I'm not happy with where we are. I know a lot of other people aren't either. We have work to do, and we know that. And one of the best things a good manager does is recognizes and understands that they have a problem and then busts their butt to figure out how to fix it. Has the sign-up process been a problem? The website, the way to navigate to get that appointment, has that been a problem? Well, keep in mind, you know, we have 650,000 people who've gotten vaccinated. Um, we just added 100,000 new appointments this week. We're going to add more next week and the week after and the week after. They're getting filled, and most of them are getting filled through the website. Um, we did a bunch of things to make the website easier to use and more uh, geographically appropriate for people, and we'll continue to do things to improve the performance of the website. Um, part of the challenge with the website is figuring out 
how to make it work with a whole bunch of entities that are not necessarily what I think of as part of our world. Um, the pharmacies, the stop and shops, a lot of the a lot of the retail organizations have their own setup and um, and they're organized to serve quote unquote their customers, which makes it a little complicated for us to make it as smooth a transaction as we would like it to be. But we're continuing to update that and to improve it. And I do think um, the launch of the call center, especially for people who aren't familiar with how to use websites in the first place, will make a big difference with respect to accessing um, appointments. This week. Well, um, I think I answered that question when I answered Jonathan's question. Pardon me? I think the most important thing we need to do is recognize that trusted community people, organizations, institutions is a big part of how you make this happen. And the fact that we've got 50 community health centers that are currently vaccinating people and that we've got many other local organizations across the Commonwealth who have standing and reputations in many of the most hard hit communities and the fact that when we had a chance to figure out how to expand our pharmacy program, we focus primarily again on communities that have been hardest hit here is a big part of how we solve the issue and the problem associated with the fact that we don't have as many people of color getting vaccinated as we would like. I think the call center will make a big difference, um, but I also think that people should, um, should tr you know, if they, if they go on the site and there's a, a site that's nearby them and there's open uh, appointment opportunities, they should take them. Was there ever any consideration of bringing in the National Guard? Some other states have had success with that. Certainly with different populations like West Virginia, for instance. Is that something you ever Well, first of all, we have some planning to do with respect to how we want to get to a million vaccinations a month, which is where we want to be eventually uh, this spring. And maybe they might have a role to play there. But the way we've been using the Guard currently is they're a major player in a lot of the work we've been doing um, to keep our nursing homes safe. And, um, and they've done a very good job on that one. And we've had dramatic improvement in infection rates, hospitalizations, and um, the tragedies of death associated with nursing homes uh, over the course of the past five or six months, even as significant increases in community transmission have taken place. They've played a really important role in helping us make sure that we keep folks who are in long-term care facilities safe. So in terms of getting people in the vaccine people's arms, you know, envision using them for that? I think on the front end of your, my answer, what I said was, as we get to the point where we're talking about trying to vaccinate as many as a million people a month, if the vaccine is available to do that, we would certainly consider um, a role for them. But if we can get this stuff done um, without them, we'll do it that way. I'm not, I'm not wedded to I'm not. I don't start with an assumption that that's where I go first. I start with an assumption that what is it we think we can do uh, to get where we need to go, and then if we need to incorporate them. Um, the best part about the National Guard is they come when you call. So I can't speak to any specific cases. Uh, what I would say is the rules of the game associated with the way the unemployment system works are made by the federal government. And, um, and we operate our unemployment program based on 
the rules established by the federal government. I don't know, as I stand here, whether or not any of the cases that you're talking about would involve circumstances or situations where, um, where waivers would be appropriate. I can tell you this. Um, we are very aggressive about making sure that we do everything we can to give people the benefits that they're entitled to. And, um, and in many cases, um, there's a ton of casework that people do to make sure that that happens. Um, that sits against the challenges that we all have in every state when it comes to unemployment with respect to the fraudulent activity that's taken place, which is not a secret at this point. It's gone on in pretty much every state in the country. And, um, and we have to factor that into the way we make decisions. But, um, but we will do everything we can within the rules of the program uh, to support people in any way we can. But the program does have rules. Those rules are enforced by the feds, and the feds do audit the program, and it made very clear to states ever since the start of this, because it's really significant money uh, that the federal government's put into this, that um, states will be held accountable for complying with the program. Governor, I think we all know that the Patriots are not the Super Bowl, but there's a certain quarterback that's playing that might be against people. Are you concerned about Super Bowl parties, super spreader events? Are they going to have any words of warning about that, and are you rooting for Tom Brady? Well, on the last part of your question about Tom Brady, um, my view on this one's really simple, okay? The guy gave the people of this region a chance to go to the Super Bowl for 20 years. And nine times out of that 20 years, he did it, along with a heck of a lot of other people. Um, as a sports fan, I'm incredibly grateful that I had a chance to live in this 20-year period, because I've lived in other 20-year periods around here <clears throat> where things didn't quite work that way. And um, so I am rooting for Tom Brady um, to win, okay? I just, I don't, I don't see how anybody around here could possibly root for him to lose, because we got, we got so much from him. Um, <clears throat> You know, I'm kind of the Grinch when it comes to almost any private event of any kind, and, and I get a lot of interesting incoming on that. Um, you know, um, the guy who stole Thanksgiving, the guy who stole Christmas, the guy who stole New Year's, the guy who stole every holiday you can think of, uh, made everybody build, you know, shoots for candy for Halloween. I actually built one myself. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, but I would say the same thing I've said before, which is, you know, Long periods of time, indoors, in close quarters, with shared food, with people who aren't of your immediate household, is just risky behavior. And, um, and I know no one wants to hear that, and I, I get the fact that uh, people are tired of that sort of thing. But, you know, my ask would be, um, if you're going to, I hope people watch the game, I hope they enjoy it, I hope Tampa Bay wins, but I hope people spend it. Um, in as safe a manner as they possibly can. We've seen tremendous improvement in our case counts over the course of the past two or three weeks. Um, we've seen big reductions in hospitalizations and ICU visits. Um, those hospitalizations and ICU trips are sometimes associated with tragedy, right? They are sometimes the precursor to somebody passing away who is loved by somebody else and some group of somebody else's. I can't tell you how important it is for people to recognize and understand that the virus is still very much with us. The feds continue to talk about some of the new variants, which make them very nervous. And, um, and I really think if you're going to watch the game, and I hope everybody has a chance to do that, you really ought to do it with the people you spend most of your days with. If you're going to be with anybody else, you know, I know this sounds a little ridiculous, but you should probably try to keep your distance. You should probably wear a mask, and you certainly shouldn't share food or drink with those folks, because that's just asking for trouble. Governor, we are getting a lot of calls right now. I don't know if you know about this, the Leonardo DiCaprio movie that is shooting is causing massive traffic backups on the mass bike right now. Um, are you, are you, I mean, it's a lighter question, but um, I'm going to ask you about it. Give me your thoughts on it. I don't know if you know anything about that. 
I don't know anything about that. Um, I didn't even know Leonardo DiCaprio was shooting a movie here. Um, generally speaking, there are a lot of rules associated with um, people's ability to use any roadway. So um, I'm actually kind of surprised to hear this, but I'll obviously check in with the, the folks at DOT and with the state police to find out what the story is. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Thanks again to Fenway and to the CIC.